and staring at you awkwardly. <clears throat> sure is good to see everyone here this morning, and a few people we have not seen in a little while. Welcome back. Looking out at the room, you know, as I look at each of you, it looks like almost everyone has completely recovered from church retreat. I don't know about you, but it took us about two days. We were just out. But what a wonderful blessing to be able to spend some quality time together and really to have some days dedicated to a study of God's Word and a focus on the nature of true discipleship. I'm sure I speak for all of you when I say that it was a challenging subject and a time to reevaluate commitments. Ultimately, I think it was a time to be reminded once again of what the Lord has really accomplished when he purchased our salvation. So I hope it was encouraging and as thought-provoking for you as it was for me. Now with that, I'm excited this morning to introduce you to a fresh chapter in the book of Revelation. And if you haven't been with us, um, we are working our way through an expository study on the book of Revelation sometimes taking roughly a chapter at a time, sometimes just a few verses. We're now in chapter 19, so we've made it a good, a good ways through the book, um, but we've got a lot more material to cover. We just came out of another parenthetical se section in the previous chapters, 16, 17, and 18 or so. And so now we're back in the action, so to speak. If you recall, uh, chapters 17 and 18, they stand out from the normal chronology of the book. And that's done so that God's people understand two things very clearly. One, how to steer clear of Babylon's evil cultural influence right now. We've talked about how, though it will be a future city and it was a past city, it's deeply entrenched in our culture and in people's thinking. It's something we need to be watching out and steering clear of right this minute. Number two, we also need to know how to praise God for the future destruction of everything that's contrary to his word. We see really... Revelation is a process of all of this evil being expelled from the world and being dealt with at last. So there's been some really great applications present in both of these chapters. And if we utilize them property, properly, we're going to live lives that are ever more holy and separated from this present world system. We are truly going to be peculiar people, as the Bible says. How do you react to news of the destruction of Babylon's influence? You know, the, the thought and the idea of this whole world passing away. I certainly hope, not like the merchants and kings that are going to be present on the earth during the tribulation. We saw that last week, didn't we? We've seen some great contrasts between heaven and earth, really in the different responses to God's justice. We're going to get some more of that today. The truth is, those things that the world deems most valuable are the same things that sadden and anger the Lord. And the things that God's people celebrate are what the world despises. Light and darkness do not mix. The very first thing we come to in chapter 19 is heaven's reaction to what has taken place on the earth. So let's read that first and then we'll talk about it. Chapter 19 and verse 1. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty-four elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God. All ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right, that's where we're going to end for today. Well, this is quite the divine celebration, isn't it? 
It's quite the contrast we see from the attitudes we saw before this in previous chapters. We're seeing heaven's response to the elimination of Babylon. And in this celebration, you have four unique groups that are mentioned. First, we have a great voice that says of much people. Next come the 24 elders. And by the way, if you want to know how you fit into this, that's you. If you are saved and are serving as a member of one of the Lord's churches, then you're in the group that's represented by the 24 elders. The last two entities taking part in the rejoicing are the four beasts and the throne of God himself. So you'll notice the great voice of much people. We have an introduction, and then we have two statements beginning with the word Alleluia. And we actually see that word four times in just six verses. The first phrase after these things is narrating something in the same sequence of events as what we've covered in the previous chapter. God is giving all these different visions to John in a particular order, but chronologically, the focus is still on that seventh vile judgment. We covered that a number of weeks ago. It's still on the end of the city of Babylon. So what I'm saying is don't stretch this out into a long period of time in your mind. It's still dealing with the same subject. Now, this is not just some people, but much people, and not just a voice. It says a great voice, and there's that word megas again. You know, aren't you thankful that we serve a God that can be described in these kinds of terms? Everything he does, he doesn't just do in a small way. He does it in a mega way. The Bible says, for strong is the Lord God. Praise God that he is not just gracious, but mega gracious. Not just loving, but mega loving. Not only merciful, but mega merciful. Not merely righteous, but mega righteous. We don't live up to any of these things, do we? We aren't anything mega, but mega bad, mega unfaithful, and mega weak. I'm thankful that though I may be all of those things and more, when I am weak, he is strong. So this great multitude is extolling the character and the works of God. And as I said, they use the word alleluia or hallelujah a total of four times. Now, if you've been around church for a while, and most of us have, you might recognize this word. Though we are familiar with it, most people have no idea what it means. In fact, you'll hear people in the world who aren't even saved saying that word in kind of a sarcastic way. What does it mean? It's simple. It means praise ye the Lord with an exclamation point. It's also very interesting that if you look into it, did you know Revelation is the only place in the New Testament where Alleluia is used? You'll find reference to it all the way back in the book of Psalms. Psalm 150 actually starts and ends with the phrase, Praise ye the Lord. But this is the only place we find it in the New, in the New Testament. So, here's a challenge for you. If you hear somebody that's lost, use that word. Tell them what it means. Talk to them about it, because they probably didn't intend to say, praise the Lord. Is your heart thrilled with the prospect of heaven today? Is your heart lining up with the word hallelujah? This is the type of thing that heaven is going to be all about. It's primarily going to be a play, place of praise and worship to God. And clearly, we're going to be a little more tolerant of loud noises in our new bodies, because every time praise is described in heaven, it's not quiet. It's extremely loud. What John heard was not some quiet expression of prayer. It was the sound of a great voice of many people. You know, this reminds me sometimes of when we're singing here. Even in such a small group and such a tiny room, it gives me a little glimpse of what that's going to be like. Now, they're praising God, but what exactly is this celebration about? You see that in the second part of verse 1 and then on into verse 2. It says, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. They're praising God here for four things. You say, well, why do I need to know these things? Well, because these are the four things we ought to be praising God for right now. I mean, if this is your future in Christ, then you might as well start practicing now with our worship and with our praise in this church. That's the point. Why do we sing? Why do we practice choir? It's just a program to give people to, something to do, right? Just to kill time? No, it's your special opportunity to praise the Lord for what he's done in your own life and in the lives of those that you love. Well, what should the saints be praising the Lord for? Four things. Number one, salvation. Are you happy about salvation this morning? Are you thankful for it? I am. Jonah 2.9 says, salvation is of the Lord, which means if God didn't orchestrate it, you wouldn't have it. 
So we praise the Lord, number one, for his great salvation. Number two, you'll see the word glory there, or doxa in the Greek. This is where we get the word doxology. Salvation and glory and power unto the Lord our God. We praise God for his glory because he deserves it. In fact, God is so zealous for his own glory that he will not share his glory with another. Isaiah 42.8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. Did you guys know that's actually an act of mercy on his part? Because every bit of glory we take from him only corrupts us. When we come together as a church, we shouldn't be coming to praise a pastor or a teacher. We don't show up here to exalt a missionary or a particular church activity or program. We praise the Lord because all of these things are and must remain about him. We're just servants, and as we'll see in a moment, merely lowly bond servants. The praise is always to be directed towards the Lord because he is the only one that deserves it. So we praise the Lord for salvation, we praise the Lord for glory, and then we praise the Lord for his honor and power because if he didn't have power, he couldn't save us or glorify himself. The word power here is the Greek word dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite or dynamic. You'll also notice that in their worship, they're not saying your God, but our God. They're in heaven. They're redeemed. God is not some type of disconnected theological concept. God is someone that we walk with and they walk with in relationship. So he's not the God or that God. He is our God. And the, very, the whole picture is very, very personal. So as we move into verse 2 now, you'll see this great multitude is really, they're just getting warmed up. The celebration continues as they say, For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, that being Babylon, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. They're praising the Lord, and we too should be praising the Lord for his righteous judgments. This isn't just some type of generic worship. Heaven is thankful for something very specific that God did, and so our worship should not be generic either. What has God done specifically for you? In this context, the Lord just finished judging Babylon, and the city was destroyed. Babylon needed to be judged, and she deserved to be judged, because you see right here that she corrupted the earth. We've talked about that. She's doing it right now. God judged the city, and he avenged the blood of the saints she had persecuted and killed. You guys see that word servants there? That's the word doulos in Greek again. It means slaves. We are common slaves. That's what the disciple of Jesus Christ is pictured as. What is a bondservant? A bondservant is someone that exists to execute the will of somebody else. They don't have their own will. And as we discussed over the past week and spent some focused time on, if you want to become a disciple of Christ, that's really what you're being called to. That is what the Lord wants out of his saints. And so now all these that have been persecuted and killed by Babylon are in heaven. Some might still be on the earth, but heaven is celebrating the destruction of this city because all of the pain she's caused during the tribulation and throughout history is over. Now we've seen one alleluia thus far. The second one appears in verse 3. It says there, and again they said alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. So Babylon keeps burning and burning. Now you might say, wait a minute, how is Babylon going to continue burning like this? Well, it's interesting, when we look at Revelation 21.8, it will talk about people going into the lake of fire. It says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars ha shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 14.11 in describing this says, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. That's how to understand the image of Babylon burning forever. First, it will literally burn down on earth, and then every last vestige of its influence, including its wicked people, will burn forever in the lake of fire. So we have this heavenly scene revealed from a number of different angles. The next is from the perspective of the 24 elders. The people have praised the Lord because of Babylon's destructions, destruction, and now the elders join in as well. Revelation 19 and verse 4 says, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. 
Now, hopefully you remember all the way back months and months ago to the beginning of this study, we w carefully worked our way through chapters two and three, which was the letters to the seven churches. We saw how the elders were first introduced and we noted that their description is extremely similar to the way that the seven churches are described. So what I think is this, I've told you already, the 24 elders represent the Lord's churches that have been taken out from the earth. The churches will be in heaven before the tribulation begins. That's why the elders are shown in heaven as various end time events are unfolding. And one of the things that the church is praising the Lord for amongst these other representatives is the fact that Babylon has finally gotten her due. Her end has come. Now, in addition to the 24 elders, we have mention of the four beasts one more time. And for reasons we brought up earlier, these are likely a specialized group of angels. What are the elders and the beasts doing? It says they're praising the Lord by falling down. That's a physical reaction. It's a time of worship that is so intense that it causes a change in one's posture. It says, and worshiped, and the verb here is proskuneo, and worshiped God that sat on the throne. Now, who would that be talking about? Jesus said in Revelation 3.21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. That's future. It hasn't transpired yet even as I also overcome and am set down with my father in his throne. So who's on the throne? The father. Who's on the throne with him? The son. Before the millennial kingdom comes to the earth, this multitude and these four beasts and 24 elders, they're so enthralled by God's righteous judgment that they're praising him. They're praising the one that is orchestrating these things. And what are they saying? The end of verse 4 says, Amen, Alleluia. We looked at Alleluia. What does amen mean? Phil actually mentioned this. I had written this before he even preached it the other week, just so you know. <laughs> what does amen mean? Uh, we say that all the time, don't we? Lots of people have no idea what it means. Jesus would say this, verily, verily, I say unto you. In Greek, that is the word amen, verily. It means it is certain. In other words, doubly certain. Amen, amen. Basically, you better listen to what I'm about to say. That's what this celebration, the four beasts, the elders, and the great multitude is doing in the presence of the Lord because it's all about the certain victory of God. They're happy. They're elated. They're excited that this wicked city has been brought down. Now, verse 5 contains a command, and then verse 6 is the response to that command. Verse 5 says, And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Are you a great servant or a small one? It's a wonderful thing that God calls us to faithfulness, not to size, isn't it? The truth is, it doesn't matter whether your ministry is small or large by the world's standards, as long as you are ministering biblically and you're being faithful to that ministry. Verse 6 shows the response to God's command. It says, And I heard, as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Again, this is loud stuff, folks. They're praising the Lord and they're exhorting us to fear the Lord. And this is the fourth hallelujah, if you're keeping track. Now, we're exactly back to where we started with this gigantic crowd of people. This innumerable amount of people. The great multitude starts and ends this paragraph. Now, verse 7 gives a little bit of a transition point in what John is talking about. We are still in the celebration, which is heaven's response to Babylon's destruction. But now John will record things that pertain to a certain institution and a specific group of people. Are you hungry for lunch yet? Well, in verses 7 through 10, we learn about a meal, yet future, but one that is well worth waiting for. So for the remainder of our time together, let's, look, let's take a look at the supper that is in our future. Something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Look at Revelations 19.7. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. I love how this verse begins with, Be glad and rejoice. Friends, if you're saved this morning, you have nothing but good things to look forward to. Do you realize that? If you are saved and are serving in one of the Lord's churches, then you are about as close to what we see happening here in heaven that you can get while still living in earth. 
Our relationship with God should make us some of the most joyful and lighthearted people around. Have you ever been around the kind of person that seems to equate spirituality with being completely miserable? The one that claims to be saved, but it's as though they pride themselves on always being the depressing Eeyore of the group. That is not how God's people should be. Not ever. We have so much to look forward to. We should be glad and rejoice today. Why is that? Well, one reason is found here in our text. Because there is something in our future called the marriage of the Lamb. In this case, it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. He says his wife hath made herself ready. Now we know who the bride is. The bride is us. The bride is the institution of the church. Not some kind of a gigantic universal thing that has no visible membership, but the organization that Christ established, the one with pastors and deacons and saints. When the Lord's churches are raptured, we're going to go from churches plural to church singular in heaven. We're talking about an event that this future local assembly will be attending. Jesus compares the relationship that he has with his institution of the church with the relationship between a bride and a groom. This brings up an important point. If you're not currently a member of a scriptural church, then you're not a part of what is spoken about here. A person can be saved, but it is possible to be saved and still be outside of what the Bible calls the Lamb's wife. This is a very special ceremony, and it's a very special supper. And so if you're saved and are a member of this church and you want to see what's in your future, you should spend some time examining not just verse 7, but verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9 are the culmination of two powerful prophetic realities that are about to become yours. According to the Bible, there will be a rapture, and the Lord's churches will be taken into heaven. We will be taken into the Father's house for seven years. That's the event that concludes God's current program here on earth, and then we will return with Christ at the end of that seven years. We've been in heaven with him, and we return with him at the end of the seven-year period. That's what's described here, where we will rule and reign alongside him under his delegated authority. That's our future. So we go up, we're there in the Father's house for seven years, and then we come right back down. Why is it so important to trust Jesus as your Savior? Because salvation determines your ultimate destiny, folks. Is your destiny what we see in these verses, or is it not? Take a look at Revelation 19 and read verse 9. And he said unto me, excuse me, and he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. You'll notice this command to write. That's John's job description. It goes all the way back to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 11, where he was told to write this vision in a book and write what he would see and send it to the seven churches. The Lord tells John to keep doing what he's doing, write it down, which is why we have the book of Revelation. So write these things down, and then he makes a statement here. Blessed, right? Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember, I told you a while ago, there are seven blessings in the book of Revelation. A sevenfold repetition of the Greek word makarios, which is the same word used in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. That word blessed is used seven times. In case you've forgotten, we're now at blessing number four. The first four we've already read. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. God promises to bless a person that reads this book and keeps it. The second blessing was upon the tribulation martyrs in chapter 14. And the third was for the spiritually prepared at the end of the tribulation. And now Makarios comes up again where we have a fourth blessing on those that are invited, those that are participating in this supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, if you want to understand God's future plans for his churches, you have to know something about the steps in a Hebrew wedding. If you understand how a Hebrew wedding worked, you'll understand exactly what your past and future are in Christ. And so I want to take a couple minutes and explain this. This is not for Israel. This is for the church. When a Jewish young man and a woman got married, how did it work back in the time of Judaism, Judaism, the time period the Bible was written in? There were actually 10 steps. I don't expect you guys to note all these down. If you need the notes, I'll give them to you afterward. 10 steps. Number one, the marriage covenant. The groom initiated and the covenant was established upon payment for the bride. And the two of them drank from the same cup. Step number two, the bride was set apart exclusively for that man. 
That's the whole significance in the marriage ceremony when the bride comes down the aisle dressed in white. It's symbolizing her purity and that she is a woman spoken for, set aside for her future husband. Number three, the bridal chamber is prepared where the groom separates from his bride and returns to his father's house to prepare this chamber. Interesting, does that remind you of anything? Step number four is the betrothal period or the loyalty test, it's called. As the two are separated, will the husband, the future husband, is he going to be faithful to his bride? Is the bride going to be faithful to her future husband? And it's pretty interesting, the whole subject of purity and the loyalty test. When you understand this, you start to understand why Joseph is more than a little upset when he finds out that Mary is pregnant. I mean, would you believe that the Holy Spirit was responsible if you were Joseph? I don't think I would have believed that very easily. And so we know an angel had to come to clear up everything in Joseph's mind because the betrothal test, number four, almost broke up that relationship. Number five, the bride is retrieved. The groom returns to get her at an unknown time, and his arrival is perceived, preceded by shouts with escorts or friends to retrieve the bride. Number six, the two are hidden away in the father's house, not for eight days, not for nine days, not for six days, but for seven days. Are you seeing the similarities yet? I hope so. During these seven days, three things will happen. Number seven, the bride will go through a ritual cleansing prior to the wedding. Number eight, they will meet the father's assembled guests in a private wedding ceremony. And number nine is the consummation of the marriage. And then finally, the two, after seven days, they come out of the father's house and they're publicly presented to the world as husband and wife, and there's a giant celebration, a feast. You ought to see some prophetic parallels here. It's amazing as we consider what's laid out in Bible prophecy. Number one, the groom initiated the covenant. He established the covenant upon payment for the bride and the two drink from the same cup. It sounds an awful lot like what Christ did for us. He initiated the relationship, and he called us unto himself. The drinking of the same cup? Well, think of what we're remembering when we partake in communion. We all drink from the same cup. The payment for your soul and the cost of this relationship is the debt that Christ paid for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. Step number two, the bride is set apart exclusively for her husband. The church is spoken for. We've been positionally set aside, sanctified for God. That's why there's so much in the Bible about, about maintaining the purity of the church. Number three, the groom separates from the bride and he returns to his father's house to prepare the bridal chamber. Now you ought to be thinking in the back of your mind about John 14 too. That's exactly what Jesus said. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So this number three is talking about Christ's 2,000 year separation from us, which began with his ascension back into heaven. And what's he doing in heaven? What's he doing in the Father's house? According to John 14, 2, he's preparing the bridal chamber. So number four, what's happening right now? We're right in the middle of the loyalty test. And this is the basis of our Christian reward or lack thereof. Not salvation, because the price has already been paid. The covenant's been initiated by Jesus. But during this time of separation, are we going to be loyal to him or not? That's why John, James 4.4 4 calls the believer that moves into false doctrine and worldliness, James 4.4 4 calls that idolatry or adultery. It's like flunking the loyalty test. James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And this brings us to number five. Eventually, the bride is retrieved. The groom returns at an unknown time, preceded by a shout to retrieve the bride. I hope you're thinking about John 14, 3, because that's also exactly what Jesus said. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What is that? That's the rapture. That's the end of the loyalty test. And it's announced by a shout. Isn't the rapture accomplished with the voice of an archangel, the Bible says? I would assume that angels, as escorts, are returning with Christ to retrieve us. And where are we going to go? To the Father's house for seven years while he's been separated from us for 2,000 years preparing our heavenly dwelling. Number six, the bride and the groom are hidden in the Father's house for seven days. 
That's a reference to the church and the Father's house in heaven for seven years. Why seven years? Because that's the length of the tribulation period. That's the entire 70th week of Daniel, as we've studied. Number seven, the bride is cleansed. The bride undergoes a ritual cleansing prior to the wedding. What's that talking about? That's the judgment seat of Christ, where Christians are either rewarded or not rewarded based on what they did during the loyalty separation time. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Number eight is the wedding ceremony. There's a meeting of the Father's assembled wedding guests, a private wedding ceremony in the Father's house. Ephesians 5.27 says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. Number 10 is the marriage feast, where the two, bride and groom, are now husband and wife and are no longer hidden. Colossians 3, 3 through 4, describes how the time is coming in history when our relationship with Christ will be on full display. It says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So what we're seeing there in verse 9 is step number 10. Do you see that? All of these other things have taken place, and the only thing left is a public feast. So much for us to look forward to. But I would ask, if we are currently in the midst of the loyalty test, then how are we living right now? Are we set apart from the heart unto the Lord that purchased our salvation? Are we true disciples, or are we playing church? Are we walking in sound biblical doctrine and practice? All of these things will come up at the judgment seat of Christ. You'll notice the very next verse after the one I just read in 2 Corinthians 5, the one about the judgment seat, says this, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So what should the knowledge of Christ's future judgment seat cause us to do? And what's the primary means of eternal reward that's spoken of here? Preaching the gospel. Are you taking advantage of every opportunity to preach the gospel? Because this will be the biggest determining factor when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is the difference between choosing to use your body for good or for bad. James 4.17 tells us, If you, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So if you're not working to persuade men of the truth of the gospel, then you're sinning. Now, we'll conclude this message with verse 10 this morning. Here we have John's reaction as a man, and it really reveals his human weakness. Verse 10 says, And I, that's John, fell at his feet to worship him. That's the angel. Then he said unto me, the angel said, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have a testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. John is emotionally overcome with what he's seeing, and unfortunately ends up having to be rebuked by the angel. God does not give his glory to another. We have to be very careful with this kind of thing because it's easy to start giving the messenger that the praise that only God should be receiving. It's also easy to drift into false worship in an emotionally charged situation. You'll notice how quickly the angel corrected John. Have you ever received a compliment from someone that has been blessed through you? Be very careful with that kind of thing. One of the best things you can learn to do in a circumstance like that is just say, praise the Lord or hallelujah. Don't praise the messenger. Praise the Lord. If God can speak through a donkey when he wants, that doesn't leave you or I with a whole lot of room for pride. Follow the example of this angel. Always strive to get the glory off yourself and right back to Jesus Christ where it belongs. I really appreciate the end of verse 10. It says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, there are many people in many churches that don't like the prophetic parts of the Bible. It's actually pretty rare in churches to even do a study through a book like Revelation. They don't want to get involved in it because they say it's too controversial or divisive. And so they spend all their time in the Gospels and they think that that's sufficient. Now, I'm not talking down on the Gospels by any means. Study them and study them thoroughly. But understand, if your whole view of Jesus comes from the Gospels and only from the Gospels, you're going to have a very lopsided view of Christ. 
you don't have a complete view of who Jesus is until you study not just the Gospel of John, but the other book John wrote at the end of his life, the book of Revelation. Because what we see in the Gospels is Jesus as the suffering Savior. Praise the Lord for that. But in the book of Revelation, you learn he, that he is something more than that. He's the ruling and reigning king, and he's coming back to execute violent judgment on every person who has not trusted in the provision he accomplished back at his first coming. We love the meek and mild Jesus. He had nowhere to lay his head. We love the manger scenes. But what about him coming back with a rod of iron and the sword of his word coming out of his mouth? What about how he will smite and strike and destroy the nations? What about that part of who he is? You ever want to figure out who's worshiping a false Christ versus the true? Start talking about that side of the equation. The reality of the situation is that what we see in Revelation is just as much part of Jesus as the suffering Savior found in the Gospels. That's one of the reasons why it's so good to go through Revelation chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We need a complete and total picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, with that we're going to conclude. This is kind of a part one of part two as we work through chapter 19. Next week we'll be given some more important information about the second return of Christ and about his interaction with the world. Now, the primary application I want us to take from this particular study pertains to this idea of a loyalty test. What are we doing with the time that we're given? Are we persuading men and taking advantage of every opportunity to obey in this and all other areas? You know, we talk an awful lot about submitting to the Lord in this church. And we encourage everyone to do that. But there is a big difference between a general call to submit to the Lord in some secret area and being told that you need to surrender to the Lord in a very specific way. Standing up here, I can tell you, it is very, very easy to tell people to submit to God in a generic and indefinable way. That requires no courage on the part of a preacher. It also requires no accountability on the part of anybody because as far as everyone's concerned, someone can submit to some secret thing that nobody knows about. I can tell you that the really hard thing to do, really hard thing to do, is to deal directly with those areas in people's lives where there is an obvious lack of submission. As a preacher, it is always the most difficult to address the places that directly touch people's flesh and their sin nature. That requires true love, and it requires boldness. If we're being honest, then we have to admit there are areas of our lives where we are willing to accept challenge, and there are parts of our lives that we are not prepared to be challenged about. All of us are this way. We are comfortable with challenge in the areas that mean the least to us, and we are most uncomfortable with challenge in the areas that are affected the most by our fallen flesh. This is how you can identify problem areas in your own heart, by the way. Of course, we should wonder, is it really a biblical challenge if I'm comfortable with it? So with that in mind, I'm going to give you a challenge this morning because it pertains directly to some of what we've talked about today and because I love you. Are you a person that because of the flesh and because of fear has not taken an active role in preaching the gospel to this community? <clears throat> Are you a person that has not submitted yourself in this critical area of discipleship? And as a result, are you right now suffering the crippling results of disobedience and fear? Fear and disobedience will only produce more of the same. They never head in a godly direction. Both of these things are actually sin. Fear and disobedience are both sin. The Bible says God did not give us the spirit of fear. That means it didn't come from him. That is your challenge this morning. If you are a person that has not been obedient... Will you repent of your fear today? Will you turn from your sin and instead submit yourself to God? James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. If you want to be brave, you must humble yourself in the sight of God. If you want to be obedient, you start by humbling yourself in the sight of God. If you want to be faithful, you humble yourself in the sight of God. The access to true bravery and boldness and faithfulness all lies just on the other side of obedience. May we all be people that are faithful during this loyalty test 
and that are able to stand without shame or regret at the judgment seat of Christ. Folks, my job is to ensure that you stand there without shame and regret because I love you. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We read today to rejoice and be glad. We have so much to look forward to. Allow that to obliterate your fear today. Let's pray.